Our next speaker is the mathematician from the blog Ask a Mathematician, Spencer Greenberg. I'm going to make the is this on? I'm going to make the case to you that we may not understand ourselves. In particular, my goal today is to try to get you to reassess your strengths and weaknesses to question whether you really understand why you make the decisions that you do, and to doubt whether you really have correct beliefs about your beliefs. Now, this idea of doubting yourself is certainly not a new one. Voltaire pointed out that while doubt is not a pleasant condition, certainty is an absurd one. Bertrand Russell said that he thought we should always try to maintain a measure of doubt about our own opinions. And Socrates took it to the next level, saying, to know is to know that you know nothing. What I'm going to talk to you about today is self-skepticism. And this encompasses three aspects of our lives. First, our strengths and weaknesses. Second, our beliefs. And third, our decisions. In particular, self-skepticism argues that in order to understand our strengths and weaknesses, it requires a directed effort, a conscious effort, that we don't just naturally understand ourselves very well. Second, that our beliefs are probably less accurate than we believe them to be. And the fact that something feels like it's true does not mean that it's actually true. Third, that we're often unaware of the real reasons that we make decisions. And the explanations we give afterwards for why we made a decision are often not the real explanations. So I would like us to be not just skeptics, but be self-skeptics as well. To use the same tools of rationality that we use to investigate claims that other people make, turn them in on ourselves, and investigate our own beliefs, our own decisions, and our own strengths and weaknesses. I'm going to start by telling you a bit about my path to self-skepticism. And I'm going to tell you three little stories from my life that took me down this path. And one of the nice aspects of these stories, is these, are, these are actually things that you can replicate yourself. So you can see if you have the same conclusions from these experiences that I did. Now my first story relates to a field known as cognitive behavioral therapy that Julia Galef actually mentioned in her talk yesterday. Now cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to be effective for treating a variety of mental disorders, including anxiety and depression. And it makes a very interesting claim about the human brain. It says that when we're feeling emotional or feeling upset, that we tend to distort reality, that we tend to have irrational thoughts run through our mind. Now, this is a remarkable claim because emotions are very common. We feel frustrated, we feel nervous, we feel annoyed. This is with us every day. And if this claim is really true, it says something about how rational we really are. But it goes a step further and claims that the types of distortions that occur are actually fairly predictable. You can look at these lists of common distortions. Usually they ten, contain 10 or 11 distortions on them. And they claim that these account for most of the irrationalities we have when we're feeling emotional. So for example, all or nothing thinking. If I do a jet, bad job on this talk, then I'm a worthless Jumping to conclusions. The audience looks bored. They must hate me. Magnification. I can't believe I misspelled bored on this slide. <laughs> My talk is ruined. When I learned about this, this claim that cognitive behavioral therapy makes, I was skeptical. I didn't believe that the daily emotions I had would cause my beliefs to be distorted. I didn't believe that it could possibly be the case because I knew I was a pretty rational person. But this was a testable hypothesis. So I went and tested it. I waited until I was feeling emotional. I wrote down the beliefs that were, and the thoughts that were running through my mind. And I checked them against this list of common distortions. And much to my amazement, I found that, in fact, almost every thought I wrote down had one of these distortions in it, or sometimes more than one of these distortions. Now, that was really interesting because it meant not only did I have a lot of irrationality in my thinking, but these irrational thoughts were somehow flying under my radar. I wasn't aware of them as I was having them. But this claim doesn't just apply to me. It, it, the claim is that this applies to virtually everyone. So could it be the case that this also applies to you? 
you can actually do this experiment yourself. You can wait until you're feeling emotional, write down the thoughts you're having, wait until the emotion subsides, and then analyze those thoughts very carefully. You can even, if you want, find one of these lists of common distortions. If you Google cognitive behavioral therapy distortions, and you can actually check, do, do, does your emotion cause you to have irrational thinking? This leads me to my second story, which relates to disagreement. So one day, I was having a debate with a friend, and I was trying to convince her of my point of view. She was trying to convince me of her point of view, and after several hours, we made no headway whatsoever. We were not able to even begin to convince the other person. And it suddenly occurred to me, this friend of mine is about as smart as I am, she's about as knowledgeable as I am of the subject we're discussing, and she seems about as certain as I do. So why is it that I think that I'm right and not her? How can I be sure that I'm the one that's mistaken? If you take an outside perspective, you imagine you're a third person watch, watching this debate. Why would you choose my side rather than hers if you know that we're about as knowledgeable, about as smart, and about as certain as each other? Just because one of our brains labels one side of the argument true, why should that be better evidence for it actually being true? Why are my beliefs more likely to be true than someone else's? I realized there is a way out of this problem. And the way out of it is that if you use reliable methods to come to your beliefs, then your beliefs really will be more likely to be true. So you need to use methods that actually tend to produce truth as opposed to producing false beliefs. So let's talk about what are some good methods for generating your beliefs, and what are bad methods? Well, let's start with some bad methods. Believe whatever it is that's pleasing to believe. Now, if you do this, you've got a problem, because some true things are pleasing, but some true things are displeasing. Some false things are pleasing, but some false things are displeasing. So if you use this methodology, you're going to end up with a smattering of true and false beliefs. It's not going to be very reliable. Another problematic method is to believe what your parents teach you. First of all, what makes you think your parents are so reliable? <laughs> Second, why believe your parents and not someone else's? What's so special about the fact that they're your parents? A third problematic method is to believe whatever your gut or your intuition tells you. A problem with this is that people's guts tend to disagree with each other. Why believe your gut as opposed to someone else's when they disagree? Second is that although intuition is often helpful, we also know plenty of examples where it gets things really wrong. So you have to be a bit wary about using this approach. So let's talk about some good methods. First good method is deduction. If an atheist is someone who doesn't believe in God, and you're an atheist, then you don't believe in God. And if someone disagrees with that statement, they're just wrong. It, there's really an objective fact to the matter about that statement because it's just using deduction. Or let's take basic probability theory. If there's a 50% chance you're a woman and a 16% chance you are blue-eyed and gender and eye color are independent from each other, then there's an 8% chance you're a blue-eyed woman. And that's just a fact. It, it, you can't argue with that. Let's look at some of the good methods that come from science. Well, first of all, we've got induction. If scientists go and measure the speed of light a thousand different times, and every single case they find the speed of light's the same, they can be pretty damn sure it will be the same the next time they measure it as well. Now, they can't be absolutely 100% competent. Maybe overnight, the laws of physics completely changed. So unlike deduction, it's not 100% reliable when done right, but it is very reliable, and it's one of the core principles in science. Another good method is testing your predictions. So one way to do this is to say, what do my beliefs predict should be true about the world? And then go and do the research or conduct the experiment to actually check that that thing is true. And if you're in a debate with someone, and you're, you, can, you can agree with them what your beliefs predict about the world and what their beliefs predict about the world, you can just go check and see. So that it's an objective method that everyone can agree on. Let's talk about some other good methods. There's Bayes' rule, which has gotten a lot of airtime this conference. Um, <laughs> Bayes' rule is a great way of evaluating evidence. What it does is it tells us whether evidence is strongly in favor of a hypothesis, weakly in favor of a hypothesis, maybe it goes against the hypothesis, so it allows us to evaluate evidence more objectively. 
Another really good method is using your gut, but using it in a wise fashion. And that means only relying on it in cases where it's proven to be reliable through lots of repeated experience. So for example, if you're a surgeon and you've done 2,000 heart surgeries, and you're conducting another heart surgery, and you suddenly get an uncomfortable feeling, something feels off, well, you probably should stop for a moment and actually take that seriously. But if this is your first heart surgery, and you get an uncomfortable feeling, it's probably just because you're cutting into someone's heart. <laughs> so you've got to be careful about using your gut and try to understand when it's going to be reliable. Another really great method is trying to disprove yourself. That means sitting down and coming up with the best arguments you can possibly think of against what you believe. Or another nice way to do that is to find the smartest, most rational person you can find and then ask them to completely eviscerate your belief system. So if you're interested in good methods for discovering truth, I'd highly recommend lesswrong.com, which is Eliezer Yukowski's rationality blog. So what are the advantages of using these good methods? Well, first of all, they're going to make your beliefs truer. But second of all, they give us a good justification for believing our beliefs rather than someone else's. If you use reliable methods to come to your beliefs, then the fact that your brain labeled something as true is good evidence that it actually is true. And if someone else's brain labels it as, true, uh, as false, and they're not using as good methods as you are, well, you have a reason to still believe your beliefs rather than theirs. My problem was, however, that when I thought about my beliefs, I really wasn't that confident that I'd arrived at them using really good methods. Many of my beliefs were generalizations from just a few examples, uh, things that I'd been taught or things that I'd heard but hadn't really checked into, and some things that I believed just based on intuition but I hadn't explicitly analyzed using my reason. And I realized because of this, I needed to go re-examine my beliefs and make sure that I'd actually generated them using these good methods as opposed to the bad methods. So how about you? How sure are you that the things you believe come from using reliable methods to determine the truth? And I think it's really healthy for us to revisit from time to time the important beliefs we have. And so I, I propose an exercise to do this. Write down a few of your really important beliefs and then ask yourself for each of them, how did I come to believe this? Try to introspect about where you got that belief from and see, did you actually use good procedures for coming to the truth or not? This leads to my third story, which is about changing my mind. So one day, on a whim, I decided to make a list of all the important beliefs I could think of that I changed my mind about. And as I did this, I realized two things. First of all, I changed my mind about a lot more things than I seemed to remember. Once I actually started putting time into it, I could find thing after thing after thing. The second thing I realized is that I almost certainly wasn't done changing my mind. Over the next 30 years, I would probably change my mind about many more things. But this is a big problem, because it means that since a number of my important beliefs are very likely to change, how can I trust the beliefs I have now? When I look at each of my beliefs, they seem to be completely true. That's what it feels like to have a belief. It feels true. And yet, at the same time, I know that I'm going to change my mind about a number of my beliefs. The only way out of this is to downgrade our opinion of each of our beliefs, to believe each of our beliefs a little bit less to compensate for the fact that we were likely to change our mind in the future. And people's beliefs really do change dramatically. I mean, there are conservatives who thought that they could never be a liberal who end up being liberals. And there are liberals who hate conservatives who end up being conservatives. There are even people who are devout Christians who end up at Skepticon. So this is the point where my three stories converge. I realize that my thoughts are often irrational when I'm feeling emotional, and this is serious because emotions are with us throughout every day. I realized that in order to believe my beliefs rather than other people's, I really needed to make sure I was relying on good methods for generating beliefs, and I wasn't sure that I was really doing that that much. I also realized that I'm very likely to change my mind about a lot of things in the future, and therefore, I need to downgrade my opinion of all of my beliefs. And this took me to self-skepticism. 
I started to doubt that my beliefs are as accurate as they feel. I started to doubt that I really understood the way I made decisions. And I started to doubt that I really understood my strengths and weaknesses. But what does science have to say on this topic? Surely there are a lot of studies that have been conducted that are relevant, that tell us whether self-skepticism really makes sense or not. In particular, I want to tell you about some of these studies, and I'm going to focus on studies related to how we make decisions and how we evaluate our own strengths and weaknesses. So first, let's talk about strengths and weaknesses. Do people have accurate self-perception about their strengths and weaknesses? And if not, then maybe that means that we're going to have to make a special effort to try to understand ourselves, that it doesn't necessarily come naturally. So the, there's a typical experimental protocol you can use to evaluate this question, which is basically you ask people to evaluate themselves, and then you check to see whether these, their answers of, of how they evaluate themselves could possibly be the case. If not, then it indicates that they may actually have, self, uh, they have poor self-knowledge. Now, one survey that was conducted found that 93% of American students claim to be in the top 50% of driving ability. These are amazingly good drivers. 87% of Stanford Business School students rated their academic performance as being in the top 50%. 68% of teachers rated themselves as being in the top 25% of teaching ability. These are crazy statistics. This indicates a very high level of self-delusion. But there's more. 94% of university professors thought they were better at their jobs than their average colleagues. <laughs> this one's really crazy. Nearly 50% of sociologists believe that they would one day become among the top 10 leaders in their field. It even seems like people don't have a good sense of how intelligent they are. Some studies that have been conducted indicate there's a pretty low correlation between how intelligent you say you think you are and your actual IQ. So all of these studies together tell us that we may not really understand our strengths and weaknesses. We may tend to inflate our own abilities. But of course, it's not always the case that we inflate our abilities. Sometimes we underestimate them as well. And this is especially true among depressed people who tend to feel like they're worthless and they're unlikely to accomplish anything of value. And there's dangers on both sides. If we overestimate ourselves, then we may actually attempt to do things that we can't handle, and we end up failing because of that. We also might not try to improve. If we're convinced that we're a good driver when we're not a good driver, we may not go work on improving our driving skills. But underestimation can be just as bad. Uh, it might cause you to not try something in the first place because you're convinced that you're going to fail. Or it might be that you give up easily when there's any kind of setback because you take it as evidence that, that you're going to fail all along. But it's not just that we have poor understanding of our skills. We can also have poor understanding of our knowledge. So here's an interesting study that found that college students were better able to predict the length of their roommates' relationships than they were of their own relationships. Now think about that. Their roommates sort of had a better insight into their relationships in a certain way than they did. Another study found that for young males, their confidence in their knowledge of condom use barely correlated with their actual knowledge of condom use. I mean, that's dangerous. That could lead to pregnancies and disease. There's also an even more disturbing study that found that physicians' self-rated knowledge of how much they knew about thyroid disorders had essentially no correlation with how they did on a test about thyroid disorders. I mean, that could actually lead to people dying. But there is hope. There is a way out of this problem. First of all, we can try to use objective measures of skill rather than just relying our, on our subjective impressions about how great we are. We can also try to introspect. We can force ourselves to search for our flaws and weaknesses rather than just waiting around for the world to, to do it for us. We can also try to seek out criticism from other people because often other people have insights into us that we ourselves don't even have. And so here's an exercise that you could try if you actually wanted to improve your self-knowledge. Sit down and make a list of some of your biggest flaws. Give this list to someone who knows you really well, who you trust, and get them to add to this list. 
Then, get, then pick a few of these flaws to work on, and over the next few months, actually try improving these things, and, and ask this other person to hold you accountable. And this is a good exercise because it forces us to try to identify our weaknesses, and it also relies on the fact that other people can sometimes see things about us that we ourselves don't know. This leads me to the second type of study I want to talk about, which are studies about how we make decisions. Now, we tend to think that we make decisions for really good reasons. When someone asks, why did you do that, do that instead of this other thing, we give them an explanation. If someone says, why did you go to this college rather than that college, we say, well, I wanted to study math, and that college had a better math department. We don't just shrug and say we don't know. But do studies actually confirm that we know why we make decisions? So there's a basic experimental protocol that you can use to test this. You take a population of people, you split them randomly into two equal groups, and then you put the two groups in two situations, situation A and situation B. The only difference between these two situations is some very tiny detail that you wouldn't expect would have a significant impact on anyone's behavior. And then you compare the behavior of the two groups to see if, in fact, they did behave the same. And if it turns out to be the case that the two behaviors of the groups are very different from each other, and it's also the case that the difference between the two situations is not something that one should reasonably take into account when making a decision, then that indicates that we may have a poor understanding of why we make this decisions, and we may be making bad decisions. So let's see what these studies say. First thing I want to talk about is dating. Suppose a stranger comes up to you and asks you out on a date, or they ask you if you want to dance at a nightclub. I want you to think for a moment. What factors would go into your decision of whether you'd accept? <laughs> STDs, if you have an STD test handy. You might also consider how good looking is this person. Uh, you might wonder whether you like their smile, how nice he or she seems. What about a touch on the arm? Would, would you take that into account, whether they touched you on the arm? Well, it turns out, according to one study, a very quick touch on the upper arm doubled a men's success rate at asking out women. It raised it from 10% to 20%. Now, mind you, these were especially attractive men that they used for this study because they found that the normal-looking men got rejected almost every time. <laughs> but I want you to think about what this statistic means. This statistic means that among the women that got the touch on the arm and decided to go on the date, about half of them would not have gone on the date were it not for the touch. That is amazing. I mean, how many of those women do you really think would say, oh yeah, I decided to go out with him because he touched me quickly on the upper arm as he asked me out? I mean, this really shows that there can be powerful subconscious influences to how we make decisions. And there was another study that found that when men asked women to dance at nightclubs, they were able to boost the success rate 50%, again, with a quick touch on the arm. Now, I don't really recommend you try this, especially considering the women here have seen this lecture as well. <laughs> the second thing I want to talk about is interviewing. Suppose you're interviewing a college student for a job. What factors would you take into account to decide whether to hire them? Maybe things like grade point average, uh, total amount of work experience the person has, whether they seem re responsible. Well, in one study, they found no relationship between either grade point average or total work experience and whether the people were recommended for hiring. What did make a difference is whether the student sucked up to the interviewer. <laughs> so this may indicate that we actually hire people because we like them to some extent, even if we're sacrificing qualifications to do so. I mean, how many of those interviewers do you think said, oh, I hired that candidate because he really sucked up to me during the interview? Or let's consider purchasing decisions. Suppose that you're thinking about getting a magazine subscription, and you want to decide, do you get the cheaper online-only version, or do you get the more expensive web plus print version, where you can either access it online, or you can, you can read the paper copy? Now, you might want to take into account various factors like, do you think you're actually going to read the paper copy? Uh, and what else might you do with that money, the extra money it would cost to get the paper copy in addition to the online version? But one really remarkable study conducted by Dan Ariely found that 
if you gave a third option that nobody actually wanted, you could massively alter people's decision making. In particular, the third option was one, it was a print-only version that was the same cost as the print and web version. So nobody would ever take it. But if you added that decoy, then rather than 32% selecting that they wanted the print and web version, 84% chose it. So how good could these people's decisions really be if they have a massive change in behavior based on a decoy option that they don't want anyway? Or let's consider something really serious, criminal sentencing. Suppose you read a criminal account and you're asked to give a sentence of how many years will this person spend in prison. You might want to take into account things like the amount of damage that the crime caused or how premeditated the crime was. But what about the beauty of the person that you're sentencing? Do you think that would affect you? In one study done on students, they found that when they were asked to give a sentence, if they swapped in a beautiful picture on the same criminal case, they gave half the sentence. That's remarkable, and that's frightening. I mean, this, think about juries. This means that people could be rotting in jail right now simply because they were less attractive than someone else. This, this is a general tendency that's sometimes called the beauty bias to actually associate positive traits with people that are beautiful, even if they're unwarranted. So all these studies put together make us realize that we're influenced by a lot of subtle factors that we're just not aware of. We think that we made this decision for reason X, but in fact, reason Y and Z may have been as big or even bigger influences that we were completely oblivious to. And if seemingly irrelevant factors can massively alter our behavior, how good could our decision-making processes really be? So how can we possibly compensate for this? Especially, it seems hard because many of these things are pretty subconscious. Well, if we learn about the things that tend to influence human behavior in irrelevant ways, well, then we can actually try to reflect when we're in a situation, say, what sort of biases might be occurring here? What influences might be affecting me that I should make sure to ignore? If we don't have this knowledge, we end up being slaves to these subtle influences. We get driven around from decision to decision, but we're not really in control of them. So let me recap quickly about what I've talked about. First tenet of self-skepticism is that it often takes a conscious, directed effort in order to understand our strengths and weaknesses. We don't just not understand them that well naturally. And we know this because of a large number of studies that show people have very inaccurate perceptions about themselves. Second, we're often unaware of the real reasons for our actions. And we know this because a large number of studies show that our decisions can be very altered by subtle factors that really we shouldn't be taking into account. Third, our beliefs are probably less accurate than they feel like to us. And we know this for a whole bunch of reasons. First, the fact that our thoughts get distorted by emotions. Second, that we generally disagree with other smart people. And if we're disagreeing with other smart people, we need a good justification for believing our beliefs rather than theirs. Third is that none of us really use good methods for producing our beliefs all the time. And when we're not using good methods, our beliefs are going to tend to be unreliable. Fourth is that our beliefs change over time. And the fact that they change means that we really need to downgrade our opinion of all of our beliefs because we don't know which of them are going to prove to be reliable. So why self-skepticism? First, to better understand our strengths and our weaknesses. Second, to better understand our decisions and actually work to improve them. Third, to end up with truer beliefs. And if you'd like to learn more, go to selfskepticism.com. You can see a lot more detail about some of the things I've discussed today. <laughs>